Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from Safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, Safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June, and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course, and if you do it before September 20th, you'll get a 20% discount. Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. I'm happy to announce that I have set up my new publishing house and online bookstore, The Safe House, which will be publishing and delivering the best Bitcoin and Austrian economics books worldwide in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook formats. Go to thesafehouse.com to buy my latest book, Principles of Economics, as well as the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard. And now I'm also publishing Fiat Food, Matthew Lishak's amazing investigation into how inflation ruined our diet and health. And I'm also publishing Lynn Alden's Broken Money, her masterful exploration of the failures of the global financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. This is a Bitcoiner's bookshop, so the books are printed in beautiful cloth hardcover made to last with an ice colored dust jacket on top. Go to thesafehouse.com and get yours now. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable health care. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash up front without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern health care insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health, and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Matthew Lee Shack. Matthew has authored a fascinating and fantastic book called Fiat Food. It was influenced by the Fiat Standard. He read the Fiat Standard and he emailed me saying he wants to write a book about Fiat Food and he wants to investigate the story that I mentioned, which, you know, if you read the Fiat Standard, you're going to think this has to be crazy. Clearly, he's making all of this stuff up. But then you dig into it and you realize, nope, it's uh, crazy because it's true. I'm not making any of that stuff up. So Matthew is an investigative journalist and he dug into it and he wrote a fascinating book, which is being published today as this podcast is being released. And I contributed two chapters to that book. I wrote an introduction. And I contributed two chapters toward the end. It's a pleasure to have Matthew join us today. Matthew and I have co-authored the book and I'm publishing it in my publishing house, The Safe House. And we've done all of that, and I've uh, gone over the manuscript, and I've given him my opinion on it. And we've done all of that without having to, without having to make a single phone call or a video call before, because if you know me, you know that I'd like to work over email, and I find it so much more efficient. So this is a wonderful testament to how much you can get accomplished without having to get on phone calls. And given the time difference and time zone, it, it's worked out very well. But it is a pleasure to be talking to you, Matthew. Thank you for joining us. Likewise, Safe, thank you for having me. And it's great to finally look you in the eye, even through this medium. I was, I was impressed. I was wondering and waiting for the phone call or even the text. But no, you maintained the past 18 months strictly email, and I respect that. Yeah, I, I don't think the I, I've 
not seen a good case for ever getting on a phone call for anything that's business related. And it's nothing, nothing personal against people that I work with. It's just what you want from work is you want something precise and writing is the most precise medium. And so it's so much more flexible to just have uh, every person read the email on their time and then respond precisely. And then that means communication is asynchronous, which meshes perfectly with everybody's schedule and it can be much more productive. And I guess the proof is in the pudding. The book is out. We did it, man. We did it. Indeed. So uh, let's begin by telling us, the, by having you tell us about uh, what uh, got you into this. And I, I don't know about this. I'm actually curious. So um, what's your history with fiat food? What's your personal angle here? And why did this resonate with you so much that you wanted to write about it? I was a fat little kid. Uh, I was too. <sighs> So you know what it's like. Um, my mom was, you know, a great mother, but she, as a raising children in the '90s, trusted the food pyramid, which told me to have six to eleven servings of grains and to substitute healthy fats for seed oils. And this wasn't controversial. Controversial back then. I mean, this was for people who are younger. This was accepted. This was the norm. And if you went against it, it was almost as though you were hurting your children. So I'm eating all this real garbage. And at the age of 16, I got cancer. And I remember. Oh, wow. I didn't know. Yeah. That. I, remember, I remember asking my doctors. I mean, I, and I didn't just eat normal fiat foods. I ate an extreme amount of sugar. I was addicted. A lot of sugar and a lot of everything had seed oils or grains that were just mass produced. There was this whole movement of like the snack well movement of these low fat, high sugar foods. And I ate an extreme amount. And I remember asking my doctors, I intuitively as a human realized that I'd done something wrong. I remember laying in a hospital bed and saying, what was the cause of my sickness? And my doctor said, well, it's nothing you did. You did nothing. Wrong. Your sickness is we don't know why people get cancer. It could be many reasons. I was a 16 year old kid. I, I didn't trust that answer. My doctors were fantastic. So the question of why has always been in the back of my head. And like a lot of people during COVID, I became cynical of the institutions that I grew up trusting, all of them. Uh, it was very transparent not to get into COVID, but that we were being lied to by authorities. And it, it was kind of like a jump the shark moment for me because it seemed as though for most of my life, even though I became an investigative reporter, so I covered crime and that was, that was my, my occupation for 15 years. This was something different. I'm used to politicians lying, but this was a mass, uh, gaslighting campaign. And they, it was very obvious that they did not have our best interests in mind. And above and beyond that, the profit motive seemed to be the number one priority. And it wasn't, it wasn't very hidden. So this led me down to your book. Um, I began questioning a lot of different things. If somebody suggested the Bitcoin standard, which I loved, but it was the fiat standard that really changed me in the sense of I... I understand enough about economics. I've had a passion for economics my whole life. And I understood enough about it to realize that you were next level. Like you're I'm not trying to, to blow smoke up your hair, but you're, you're, a lot of your concepts were different to me. You weren't just reorganizing Austrian economics. You were, you were really, it was a transformational book in terms of not only my ability to understand very clearly what the fiat system was, but new economic concepts too. But it was your chapter on food that kind of made me question you. I'm thinking, man, this guy definitely knows a lot about economics, but this is, uh, this, this is bordering nutty. Um, you're making this claim that there's this hundred year conspiracy to hijack our food system all for profit by anti-meat religious groups and big agro-industrial and uh, medical industrial complexes combined with politicians. And I just thought, uh, but I was curious. I, I was very curious and I, I respected your other work. So I began digging. And what I found wasn't that you were nutty. It was 
in fact, based on just pure evidence, if you were understating the case, what we've experienced over the past 50 to 60 years has been the biggest gaslighting campaign and the most consequential in terms of human life. And in my book, Fiat Food, I make the case, I know a lot of your audience probably understands this already, but I go through and, you know, we cite over 200 sources and I've read 80 different studies and I've filed beyond belief in the amount of FOIA requests through the government. But I walk the reader through exactly how this happened, like I would a crime, like I've done in crime. And I think the results um, are, are just stunning. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's absolutely mind blowing. I think there is a part of me, in a sense, uh, that has kind of held back. Which you know, my listeners are probably going to think that's weird because I'm not generally associated with holding back. But in a sense, while writing this, I mean, you just need to well, while writing the Fiat Food chapter in the Fiat Standard. Uh, I mean, you just have to point to incontrovertible, in undeniable facts that are out there in the public record and put them all together and then you just paint a, 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 an astonishing picture it didn't it didn't require me to do much um, hyperbole or to try and talk up the case because it was still pretty obvious and also because i mean i'm not an investigative journalist and my book was about the monetary system, and I think I just did enough to establish the case that it was inflation that was behind all of this stuff. I, I had other chapters to get to. I didn't have room to do this. But this was something that I wanted to write in the Bitcoin standard initially. I remember while writing the Bitcoin standard, while I had the outline and I had the um, introduction written out, I had a chapter planned for food, but then I just started digging into it and I just thought this is a rabbit hole way too big to fit into this book. I had a word limit from the publisher and I wanted to stick to it and it was just too difficult to try and fit all of that into it. And so I thought I'll write it later. And that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to write the fiat standard because I just had a lot to explain about the impact of fiat on food as well as science and uh, climate to science and uh, research and academics and universities. So I thought I would put all of that into one book and that was the fiat food. But yeah, there is just so much out there. In your book, you do an enormous amount of digging into the things that led to this. I think perhaps one of the most interesting ones, which is something that I was not uh, very clear about, is why is it that Nixon went along with the um, suspension of the gold standard? And that's something that seems kind of counterproductive, because if you look at Nixon, he generally ran as a conservative, generally associating himself with more free market uh, conservative ideas when it comes to um, money. So you would not expect him to associate himself with, you know, some something as drastically Keynesian and almost unthinkable at that time as going off gold. And I think this is this is a very important point that most people miss, which is you you go from a world you know, the, the way that the Overton window shifts, where in the 1960s, you know, if you said we're going to go off gold and they're going to close the gold exchange window, you would have been a crazy conspiracy theorist. But then by 1975, if you said we went off the gold window and that was not a good thing, you were also a crazy conspiracy theorist. So, you know, you, 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 the, the Overton window shifts <laughs> across from you and you end up outside it in both cases. It's either, no, everything is fine. Governments are spending uh, money, but it's okay. And we are going to maintain the gold peg. And of course, we're going to be on gold forever. And only crazy conspiracy theorists think that we're going to suspend gold redeemability. And then you shift to only crazy conspiracy theorists would oppose suspending gold redeemability. So uh, one, of, one of the most fascinating parts of your book uh, was this discussion about Nixon. So what was his deal? What changed his mind? Nixon had a thirst for war. And if we, we have to kind of go back into what was happening at that time. In 1970, America, we were involved in, Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, and we had been for a few years at that point. Up until that point, as you mentioned, Kennedy and the predecessors of Nixon, Lyndon Johnson, all affirmed that they were going to maintain the gold standard and the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was an agreement that we would always redeem gold at $35 an ounce 
other countries would pin their currency to our dollar. But what essentially happened is America overspent. They did not have enough gold to back up the paper gold redemption notes that had been put out. And it was only a matter of time until all it would take was a few countries to begin at the same time trying to redeem these notes to find out that we had committed a terrible fraud on the world. We just didn't have it. We didn't have the gold. Um, so Nixon was faced, and this wasn't entirely Nixon's fault. I mean, the deficits began under the Great Society of, they really began to accelerate under the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson and were, were continued under Nixon. But Nixon didn't have, a, he, he didn't have a lot of choices. He, there was paper floating around. We didn't have the gold to back it up. And a few countries began sensing this and redeeming their notes for gold, which was hurting our reserve of gold. So when Nick, on August 15th, 1971, when Nixon took to the air to do what later became known as the Nixon shock, it was less out of choice and more out of necessity. Also keep in mind, he wanted to continue the war. And you'll find that that's a theme with fiat and war, as you, you outlined in, in the fiat standard that without fiat, you, you, without creating money out of thin air, it's very difficult to get war perpetuated for any length of time or resources because the under a gold standard or a Bitcoin standard or any hard currency, you have to have the uh, consent of, of the public for war. And w the people don't want war. Yeah. But, you know, uh, when you have a money printer, then things become a lot easier. It's, it, it should be clear. I think um, a lot of people say Nixon abandoned the gold standard. This is kind of what common parlance is usually says. But to be clear, the U.S. was not on a gold standard before Nixon uh, went off. Closed. Technically, what he did was close the gold exchange window. The U.S. was arguably on a gold standard up until... 1917, and then they resumed going back on the gold standard until 1921. Sometime in the 1920s, they went off. And if anybody's interested in the history, I strongly recommend Murray Rothbard's amazing and excellent book, America's Great Depression. Yeah. It, it explains this uh, history very, very well. So the U.S. went off the gold standard when they joined World War I in 1917. And, 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 and there's a clear definition of what constitutes a gold standard. Um, and it means the fact that you can just take your dollar bill, whatever denomination, take it to a bank and redeem it for physical gold. It's a very, very clear uh, metric. And this is what's so beautiful about the gold standard. Uh, well, it's a lot more beautiful if you don't know how Bitcoin works, because before Bitcoin, this was a very, uh, this was very advanced Bitcoin, pro proto Bitcoin technology, effectively. What was beautiful about it is that it, it was very simple. You had a $10 bill in your pocket and you can just walk into the nearest bank. If you can get physical gold for the dollar, then your country's on a gold standard. That means anybody can walk in and redeem their papers with gold. Now, to be clear, even before 1914, they weren't exactly on a 100% pure gold standard. There was still a lot more notes outstanding than the gold that was held in reserve because banks practiced fractional reserve banking and occasionally and frequently had bank failures and so on. So it wasn't exactly a, a great thing that they had going with the gold standard. It wasn't ex as good as it could be. But it was good enough that you could still redeem. If everybody wanted to redeem, there wasn't enough gold. But there was enough gold to redeem the money of everybody who wanted to redeem. But that was no longer the case in 1917. But then they went back on the gold standard in 1921. And then the British, in, um, and, and Murray Rothbard did, did, did details this fascinating episode, very important episode in uh, 20th century history, the British had still gone off the gold standard and they wanted to go back on a, uh, on the gold, they'd inflated the money supply, the money supply had gone up. They wanted to go back on the gold standard, but the problem was they wanted to stick to the old price because they didn't want to admit that they did all of this inflation because of course it was all surreptitious. And we'll talk about that on um, uh, the role John Maynard Keynes played in a bit. 
So because of that, they suffered a leak of gold from Britain to the U.S. because everybody, gold was undervalued in Britain. So everybody was taking gold out of Britain and sending it to the U.S. because you could sell it for dollars in the U.S. and then exchange the dollars for pounds, and that was a much better deal. And this is, this is what happens when you have a gold standard and you start messing around. You make gold, if you make more money and if you make more paper money than there is physical gold, and you maintain the old exchange rate, and you still try and maintain redemption, then everybody redeems their gold and sends it outside of the country, exchanges it for dollars or French francs, and then sends the French francs, uh, and then exchanges the French francs for pounds and sends the pounds back, and you get a better deal from that. So going off the gold standard means you're gonna not have any gold left effectively if you try and keep it at the old exchange rate. And that, so the British should have gone back on the gold standard in the 1920s, but instead they figured out that, hey, if we just make the French and the Americans engage in inflation to catch up with us, we can devalue their currencies and then we can remove the premium and we can stop the flow of gold from Britain. And that's when the US got off the gold standard effectively in the 20s. That's what led to the 1929 stock market crash and then later on the depression. And so after that, they only resumed uh, going, they, know, they didn't go back on a gold standard. They went on an international gold exchange window wherein central banks and only central banks could redeem dollars for gold from the uh, US uh, treasury. But that offer was only valid up until 1971. And the reason was because as long as you didn't have to, you didn't have to redeem dollars from individuals in the US, then you had a lot of leeway and you could continue to print. And these dollars were used for trade all over the world and all the rest of the world was using them for trading. So people needed dollars. And because of that, people continued to stack dollars. So you had plenty of room to engage in a lot of inflation in the 1950s and 60s, which can only last for a while before a lot more dollars start coming back home and asking for the gold. And that's what happened when uh, French President uh, de Gaulle asked for his gold, and then the Germans wanted to ask for their gold, and that's when Nixon did his Eric Cartman impression and said, screw you guys, I'm going home, <laughs> and just wouldn't redeem it. But yeah, but I mean, the, the the political aspect of it, which I found interesting, is that it goes down, it goes back to, which you, as you mentioned, goes back to him wanting to win elections. He just came to the realization, we need to print money to win an election, and it, uh, he met with his team at Camp David, and that was it. They, 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 he, he abandoned all of the ideas that he'd had before, and he just decided, we're all Keynesians now. And it worked. It worked remarkably well in the beginning. 1972, Nixon re-elected with 49 states, which is remarkable. There, were, there was unanimous, near unanimous applause. Um, suddenly, the New York Times, who had disdain for Nixon, is, is all in on Nixon. All the elites who, yeah, I'm not a psychologist, it seems like Nixon really did want approval based on what I can read of him. They were all applauding Nixon and he was in his glory. Then reality began to creep back in as inflation rose. And in, in Nixon's speech, it's really interesting. I tried to include a lot of it in the book, in Fiat Food. And he he specifically takes on inflation. And the critics, before... They even come out. He says, look, the bugaboo of inflation, it only matters if you decide to go outside of the country. If you try to spend elsewhere, but for just a normal person, you're not going to notice it. And prosperity, we're about to enter a, a huge era of prosperity because we've done this of separating ourselves completely from gold. It's kind of haunting to look at this speech now in context to where we are as a country 50 years later. And you can, you can see all these parallels that not, and not just in food. Food's what, what, what I tackle, but in everything from architecture to artwork to most importantly, I would say the food supply, how it's all denigrated along with the, the currency that we use. Yeah, absolutely. Ruin the money, ruin the world, to uh, paraphrase a common Bitcoiner saying. Bitcoiners say, fix the money, fix the world. Well, Fiat's motto is ruin the money, ruin the world. And it's, I, I mean, I, I, I've seen this, um, I, I've seen people, when I first started discussing these ideas, when I first talked about food uh, in the context of Bitcoin and money, 
generally the first reaction that you get is dismissive laughter. And that's generally how most TV viewers handle new information. It's just the way this is not on CNN. So this guy must be crazy. Ha ha. Let's laugh at him. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. You see it everywhere and you just can't help but notice. Uh, one of my favorite stories is the week in which I published uh, the Fiat Standard. The Fiat Standard was published in uh, I think November 16 or 17, 2021, so a week before Thanksgiving. And on the day that I published it, or in the same week that I published it, the Federal Reserve of St. Louis um, published a tweet saying, explaining how you can actually save a lot this Thanksgiving dinner by having a healthy tofu turkey rather than an actual turkey and how that's going to help fix the weather. Because as we all know, we've um, <laughs> regressed back to such a primitive, um, superstitious uh, society that people genuinely think what they eat is going to fix or ruin their weather. It's absolutely insane. And so, you know, why is the Federal Reserve playing Betty Crocker? Why are they being Jamie Oliver? Why is it in their any of their business? Why is it part of their mandate what you eat? Why do they care if you eat turkey or tofu? It, there's no easy answer to that question, except they want you to eat tofu because it is cheaper. And if everybody ate tofu, that's going to make the price look like it is a lot lower. It's going to make inflation look like it is a lot lower because you know, the price of your... Um, Thanksgiving dinner is going to go down significantly. And so then they get to say, well, inflation is not that bad of a problem. But it wasn't just that tofu turkey dinner in 2021. This has been going on for a very, very long time. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, role of the Seventh-day Adventists. This is absolutely mind-boggling. I never knew anything about the Seventh-day Adventists before I started digging into this stuff. And I have I still don't quite understand why this sect of Christianity has developed this extreme obsession with meat. So tell us what you found. So I, this is one of the parts of my book when I try to explain it to people. There's a point where I realize that I'm, I'm losing them because they think it's not real. It's real. It, it started with this woman named Ellen White and she, is a victim of brain damage. Apparently she got hit in a, by, by a rock very hard as a child in the head and was in a state of near coma for a period of time. And then when she woke up, she began having visions from God and these visions from God, they, they explain, God explained to her that sex and masturbation essentially were the root of all cause, all disease, everything wrong with the world. I mean, it's a list. And she started the Seventh Day State Church. And what caused carnal desires was meat. And this wasn't this. This sounds very wacky to us today. This was a very prominent belief. And she had somebody named um, John Harvey Kellogg, who worked for for her, and they became very close. And she tasked him with trying to find a food that would both nourish people and most importantly, prevent them from having carnal desires. And that's how he invented uh, cornflakes. And arguably it, it worked really well, but if you wanna know a little bit about John Harvey Kellogg, he was a celebrity doctor of the day. He gave speeches, he wrote books, he was, he was huge. It's hard to find an equivalent of John Harvey Kellogg today. And this was a man who, in his books and in his private practice, would advocate putting carbolic acid on the clitorises of young girls to prevent them from masturbating, use cages, uh, surgery without anesthesia, all because he was a firm believer that everything, I mean, the list of diseases he attributed to masturbation was intense. Everything was due to these carnal desires, which was the result of meat. So the whole point of this religious sect was to bring about the salvation of man through killing their sex drive through food. And I would argue that he was remarkably successful in doing so if you look at today's current rates of uh, fertility where we have everybody eating cornflakes every morning 
for 50 years. And now suddenly the human race has become uh, much less fertile. But they became, the Seventh Day Adventist Church didn't just uh, keep their beliefs inside their religion. They then infiltrated all these government agencies. So the ADA, the American Dietetic Association, is an offshoot of the Seventh Adventist Day Church. And in my book, in Fiat Food, I have the lineage down. I, I show how it's John Harvey Kellogg and then all these different protégés of his are now running our dietary system. And it's not a small amount. Right now, um, Lowe Belinda University, which is the main university that does comes out with these bullshit dietary studies, it's the main nutrition uh, science where, that generates studies advocating vegetarianism and, and the evils of meat. To the and, and to the tune of where they they've gotten 165 million dollars in, in in government grants to conduct these studies. So I'm talking about John Harvey Kellogg. I'm talking about Ellen White. And yes, these people they're they're trying to kill the human sex drive. John Harvey Kellogg. Then after he left Kellogg, decided to become a eugenist, genesis, which is very consistent with his with his belief system. They are currently running our dietary system under the guise of science. And it's not science. So these studies that come out of Loba Linda University, and I track this in my book, these are studies where you look at the doctors and they're the same religious people advocating the same religious things. Now they've gotten better with their language. They don't talk about masturbation as much, but they've never lost message. They've stayed on point with the meat and they've never given it up. And if you look at their studies, they're all I don't want to get too into weeds with your audience. Well, they're all observational studies, which are me handing you a flyer and asking you what you did. So you're asking a Seventh Avenue State person who, first of all, they don't drink and smoke. So that's, that's, that's another that, that isn't taken into consideration. But these people, I don't know if they're going to feel comfortable talking about the meat consumption when the questioner realizes and they all have this idea that they go to hell for it. So the fact that, We've let these people anywhere near our health system, much less let them drive it, is not a conspiracy. It's not just a oops of history. I would say it's responsible for untold deaths and destruction, and it's something that needs to be addressed. And you brought it forward to my attention in the fiat standard. And when I looked into the money flowing from government agencies into Loba Linda University, to conduct research that only reinforces their already preconceived religious doctrine, which is all it is. It, it just makes you want to scream and say, because you've had these conversations and you'll say, people hear you eat me and they'll say, well, what about this study? No, no, the study is an observational study where you're asking a bunch of Seventh Amnesty Church uh, people conducted by the church. It's not science. So because it's on PubMed, does not make it science. And trying to get this through to people, there's so much noise and they've, they've scattered so much doubt into the public ether that sorting through it became pretty, pretty consuming for me in context to, to getting the book to have clarity. Yeah, it is absolutely mind blowing when you think about it because there's, I mean, for most people, they just have this idea that, well, somebody in a position of authority talks to you with a firm voice, and then, you know, they're in the position of authority. That's, um, some argue this is the main fun, the main thing that you learn at school, and all of the math and geography and stuff is all just, uh, <laughs> it's just filler. It's, they're just tricks to uh, condition you into this state of mental obedience, wherein when, whenever anybody says something, you know, if they're in the position of authority, you listen to them. And so just people, people just assume that there, if there's an American Dietetics Association, then those people clearly must know what is best when it comes to the issue of food. If there's an American Heart Association, then those people must know what's best um, when it comes to your heart. And they don't. These people, as you mentioned, they are a religious group. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. You know, people talk about, um, America being a secular nation, about the separation of church and state. 
And even most religious people are happy about the idea of the separation of church and state because they think mixing church and state is bad for both. And I can definitely see the case for that. And yet this thing, this religious view has managed to seep into these institutions in a way that is absolutely mind-boggling. And you do a great job of detailing it because it's very well documented. You don't have to look and dig very deep to see the connections. These things were established by specific people with these specific mandates, and they've never shied away from this, and they've never... Uh, come to any kind of conclusion that is in any way different from this, they, that there's never been any kind of open inquiry about this that had concluded, well, here's a bunch of studies that say maybe you should have some meat because it's good for this, or it's good for that. It's always just, here's why you should reduce your meat, here's why you should have soy, here's why you should have cornflakes, here's why you should have this. And it's just advertising, but it masquerades as uh, imp impersonal, uh, dispassionate, objective science, sadly. And I I find this in all realms of nutrition science, it's, it's, it's in two vectors. It's the religious component and then industry. And in terms of industry, it's these large companies funding nutrition science. So there, the, the amount of neutral science that comes out into the mainstream and people who've trusted these institutions, they trust data, they trust experts. And we've been inundated and gaslighted now for 50 years about saturated fat, cholesterol. I mean, one of the arguments I have in my own head is whether a lot of these people are evil, who perpetuate what are known lies. I mean, you look at somebody like Ansel Keys and he knew the data was in front of him. He knew about cigarette smoking being bad. He, he understood he had this data, but he drove the idea that saturated fat, the fat found in meat, linking it to high cholesterol and saying that that was the result of heart disease. If you want to go back, you can look at that seed. And I would, I would argue that it's responsible for more death. And, and destruction of the human race than potentially any person who's ever lived and his ability. It's, that's the other thing. It's like you, when I was doing research, you find the force of personality, how key that is, how somebody like John Harvey Kellogg or Ansel Keys, these were very, uh, John Harvey Kellogg walked around wearing a white suit with a bird on his shoulder, like humming and singing, very charismatic characters. Ansel Keys was, a narcissist on the level, on an unbelievable level. And, but he was able to, in, in a vacuum of leadership, he was able to step in and push these ideas onto the public that really caused untold damage. And so when I think, were these people evil? I, I mean, I think it's really more about once you understand that we are an ends to a means a means to an ends on their profit, then it's a lot easier to understand how it all works. Every step that these, whether it's industry, the medical complex, or the Seventh-day Adventist State Church, and our government, all these steps are in their benefit, whether it's to reaffirm the religious beliefs for the salvation of humanity, to drive profits for industry, or to mask the effects of inflation and to keep the most powerful thing that's ever been created in mankind, which is a fiat money printer, giving, giving them unbelievable power by being able to access the wealth and productivity of, an, of the, the wealthiest nation that's ever lived. You'll see that every step of the way, it's never to empower people, it's to empower them. And once you can see it through that spectrum, suddenly it all begins to make more sense. And it sounds less like a conspiracy then. And it's just separate people really acting in what they perceive as their best interest. Yeah, I think with the uh, Seventh Adventist Day crowd, I think it's um, it's just religious zealotry gone yeah. wild. I think none of these people really think of themselves as being evil. None of these people is out there to make people suffer. Um, they were heavily influenced by the visions of Ellen White and uh, Leanna Cooper. Leanna, I think, was her name, well, who was the other 
a major figure in in, in the church. And so the, the, they got these ideas and they ran with them. So you can sort of see how, it, it, you know, the religious uh, mind can be hijacked by this because if you venerate authority, if you think this is ordainedly divine, uh, or divinely ordained, then you're going to, you know, it's you could get very wrong. And we see examples of religious extremists doing all kinds of crazy things all over the world. And they don't think of themselves as being evil. In fact, they think of themselves as being righteous. But with Ansel Keys, I think it's very, very difficult to argue that uh, he was not a sick, truly evil person. There's reports about him having, um, uh, you know, he, he lived until he was 100. And there are reports that he used to eat uh, eggs and bacon for breakfast. And uh, he, for him, it was a practical thing. It was uh, the issue with fat was, well, you know, you can't feed animal fat to everybody. So we need to tell them to just eat like uh, the Mediterranean diet, which has, uh, which is essentially the diet of starving Mediterranean peasants in the aftermath of a world war, but nothing like the diet that uh, what Mediterranean people wanted to eat. All over the Mediterranean, people rely heavily on animal fat, and they rarely, if ever, eat, um, they rarely, if ever, cook with olive oil. The idea that you cook with olive oil is just a new thing invented by Harvard to try and promote uh, um, and, and the reason they promote olive oil is not for the olive oil itself. It's because you want to vilify animal fat. You want to tell people to have olive oil. And then if they're going to have olive oil, it's a very short hop from olive oil to soybean and all of that um, hydrogenated garbage. Because, I'm sorry, olive oil fanatics, this is going to hurt your feelings a lot. But it's extremely difficult to tell apart olive oil from soybean oil. It's extremely difficult to do it even in a laboratory. So you could take two things and the, the two oils in a lab and it might be difficult for people to analyze and figure out which one is which so if a lab cannot tell the difference then uh, you know your body probably doesn't tell much of a difference either um, no such problems with ghee or tallow or butter uh, they can very easily tell them apart from um, industrial poison but um Ansel Keys, I think the work that he did is absolutely astounding. He, you could make a case for him being the person who has caused the most deaths in human history. I think there's a strong case to be made there because he was extremely pivotal in uh, pushing this idea. And, uh, you know, he had a soapbox of Harvard University to promote his ideas and it just uh it it took off and until today it's it's astonishing people cite his seven countries study until today as if it is something authoritative when it is an astonishingly bad study it's it's, it's a great example of how not to do statistics so um tell us more about uh, ansel keys and what you found while digging in on him uh well he was uh a a paid shill in large part, but it wasn't the money that it seemed like motivated him. And it's hard to get in the mind of somebody. It He craved fame. And when he came up with his diet heart hypothesis, look, a 12 year old could read that study. I'm convinced and understand that his seventh, seventh country study and understand that it was faulty. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't science. It was something else, but Again, the force of personality, he was able to go to the American Heart Association. Now, keep in mind, put ourselves back in that situation. I believe it was 1950 that Eisenhower had a heart attack. And previous to that, I mean, heart attack, some doctors would go their entire practice without having a patient who had a heart attack. It was very rare. But when the president had one, it shook people and heart attacks began to, to happen. And there was this, this race to find out what was the cause. And he had this idea that it was saturated fat, which caused high cholesterol, which caused heart attacks. And he, it, it was, it's very apparent that he went and conducted research to validate his belief. And through force of personality was in, he looked like a great doctor. I mean, there's, I don't know if you've seen the videos of him. There's videos of him doing demonstrations. Like he looked authoritative and it's, he, he spoke authoritatively. He was a very good personality in that sense. 
he shows up at the American Medical American Heart Association, who had just the previous year said Ansel Keys' study about the diet heart hypothesis, n- not enough research on it. And uh hat tip to Nina Teichels. She she outlines this pretty well in her book, uh, The Big Fat Surprise. But he gets appointed to the board despite having zero experience in cardiology or nutrition. He just doesn't have, there's no credentials for him in these, these areas. And he's able to persuade them within one year to state and validate his diet heart hypothesis. And this diet heart hypothesis through his proteges became American food policy. You know, people might not understand this or might find this crazy, but there was a period where people just knew what to eat. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't need to buy books. They didn't need to, to buy fiat food. They didn't need to buy, to listen to you. They, they actually just knew what to eat. They didn't, they weren't confused. Um, but now for the first time they were being told what to not eat. And that was meat. And the effect of this, it's, it's just hard to overestimate. And then it grew worse. So every time the government since the American Heart Association, I believe in 1962, first said we should limit our consumption of saturated fat found in meat. Every time they came out, it was always in one direction, less meat, more grains, until we climax, I believe, with the 1992 food pyramid, which is, I would argue, a complete recipe for metabolic destruction. Six to 11 grains, don't eat a lot. Of, like I think I'm pretty sure saturated fat was lumped in with sugar. Yeah. And as, as the very top of the pyramid, and I remember as a teenager, you- But this was not 1992. This was um, uh, 79 or 80. 80. 80, the dietary guidelines came down. The food pyramid, I think, climaxed in 92. That's when, that's when we began telling people exact portions. So at least in 1980, it was vague. The nutritional guidelines posted in 1980 didn't give us exact amounts. Suddenly in 1992, we're told, and that's what spurred this whole low fat atrocity of a movement, which was you, you snack well cookies. So if something was high sugar and there were pamphlets that came out recommending if you're hungry for meat, eat gumdrops. This was coming from our authorities. This was coming from the highest minds in America. And in doing so, it had this ripple effect across the whole world and it resulted in complete devastation of our health and my i you know, look it it doesn't take a it doesn't take a nutritionist to look around i don't i don't know if you have a walmart in beirut but you've been to america you go in line people are sick everybody is fat people aren't fertile anymore you you got to look around and wonder what changed when did it start and you could trace it from 1980 to now and just see a complete collapse. And it's, it's just, it's astonishing. And when I lay this argument out in my book, when I dug into the research, you just find out that all the institutions that we had grown up trusting and having faith in, they all monetized us. We became products. And when you can see it like that, it, it just, it comes into line and it's this, it's beyond disturbing. And I, I'm want part of the reason I wanted to write this book and I felt like it was important was, I mean, we got to start punching back because reality is there. And I feel like once you can really punch through somebody's cognitive dissonance and you just plant that one seed safe, like you did with me in your chapter on food and fiat food, all of a sudden, you see things for how they are. You walk into the grocery store and you look at the middle aisles and it, it's no longer food. You see what it is. You see that it's, it's, it's garbage. It's not fit for food. It's, 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 it's loosely, it should be loosely defined as food. Yet we all have, we've gotten to this point where when you and I are in a social circumstance and it comes up, which is always a fun time, and you try explaining it to people, you're the one that sounds crazy for stating that we're basically eating a diet that has been popular with humanity for thousands of years up until about 50 years ago. The PSYOP is impressive. The syllabus for my new online economics course, Principles of Economics, is now available on safeadeen.com. The course will take place over 18 lectures, each based on one chapter from my new book, 
Principles of Economics, which will be available for free as an ebook for everyone registering for the course. Lectures will be released once every two weeks on Mondays, starting on the 25th of September, 2023, and will be available in video and audio format. Live discussion seminars will be held once a week on Thursdays at alternating time slots, 12 hours apart, to ensure learners can attend from all over the world. I'm happy to announce that I have set up my new publishing house and online bookstore, The Safe House, which will be publishing and delivering the best Bitcoin and Austrian economics books worldwide in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook formats. Go to thesafehouse.com to buy my latest book, Principles of Economics, as well as the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard. And now I'm also publishing Fiat Food, Matthew Lishak's amazing investigation into how inflation ruined our diet and health. And I'm also publishing Lynn Alden's Broken Money, her masterful exploration of the failures of the global financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. This is a Bitcoiner's bookshop, so the books are printed in beautiful cloth hardcover made to last with a nice colored dust jacket on top. Go to thesafehouse.com and get yours now. What I find the most astonishing about the extent of the PSYOP is just how every single place I've ever been in the world, if you drink liters of uh, Pepsi or Coca-Cola, nobody bats an eyelid. It's, it's very rare that anybody would ever tell you, oh, you know, you should watch it. You shouldn't be drinking this stuff. And if you do say that to somebody at some point, somebody you care about, a friend or a family, try and mention it to them. It's always, well, I mean, shouldn't say always, but you know, the, the, the vast majority of the time, why is this weird person concerned about me eating this entirely wholesome, normal food that everybody eats? You know, look at the supermarket. They're jammed full of those things. Everybody's eating them. And yet these very same people, you know, you'd dig into a fatty steak and without fail, they'll tell you that's got a lot of fat in it. You should watch your cholesterol. And, 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 and that's the one thing that people all over the world, it, it blows my mind just how widespread it was. I know my own grandma, she passed away a few years ago and she used to live in Saudi Arabia and they moved there in the fifties. I mean, that, it, it, Saudi Arabia in the 1950s was uh, they just discovered oil. They didn't have much infrastructure. There weren't a lot of people who were educated. There wasn't a lot of media. It wasn't a very advanced society by any metric. And yet, as early as the 1950s, uh, my grandfather told her, no more cooking with, uh, with ghee or tallow. And you've got to buy these. I'm going to be buying these giant containers of crappy, um, processed oil because it's what the doctor says is best. It's absolutely amazing how it managed to get there. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny story in my family you know, that has run for decades that my grandma used to try and cook with that stuff and it would, food would always come out tasting terrible. And the way that she made her food delicious was that she would buy uh, ghee and she would hide it in the kitchen and use it <laughs> surreptitiously in the food. And she was well known amongst all of the family friends that she would cook the best food. And no, nobody knew her secret until one day my grandfather busted her. And after years of denial, after years of saying, no, 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 this stuff doesn't, it will never enter our house. It never enters the house. My grandfather discovered that she had had a stash hidden away in the dark cupboards of the kitchen. And she was using it strategically in meals and that's why people loved her food and it's it's so it's so maddening for me because people in my family still recite that story about my grandma and how she hid the, and they still recite it as if she's the bad guy you know in a funny kind of way like can you imagine she would feed people all of these really harmful fats rather than just eating like normal people and having the industrial uh, oils and it's 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 and, and and until today i try and talk to people in my family about this like no she was right that this is the best thing she ever did in her life that she fed you this fat and completely just flies over the head it's incredible it's incredible you know how it managed to brainwash people i i i've traveled many places in the world and everywhere i go you see the same thing you get people telling you Always, you know, you should watch out. You shouldn't eat too much fat. This steak has a lot of fat in it. This meat has a lot of fat. Oh, no, you should watch out for butter. 
should watch out for the cholesterol and the eggs. This is universal health advice that you get from fat people everywhere in the world. And it's astonishing how far it has traveled. And it's going to take a lot of time to undo that, unfortunately, because it's just so deeply ingrained in people's minds. I, Some of the closest people in my family, I've spent, I know, I've, I've been on this kick of reducing carbohydrates and processed food for 15 years now. They haven't, it, it hasn't even entered their mind to consider that I might have a point. Every time they see me, it's like, wow, you don't get old and you don't get fat. Uh, what's your secret? Yeah, my secret is I don't eat the garbage that you eat and I eat this stuff. It's like, oh, you're still on that weird diet. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and just completely not connect the fact that the weird diet is what's making me not fat while they continue to get fatter. And it's just, it's very hard to overcome the brainwashing. Ansel Keys, I mean, he has just, he has killed so many people. It's incredible. When I, when I was writing this, I was really focused largely on what the root, what, what is at the root of, when I, when I covered crime, I covered ma every mass shooting you could imagine. Uh, my particular field of interest was motive. Why are these people doing these things? And I approached this book the same way. And when I, when I got to the core problem, it became very clear that it was an issue of self-autonomy. And, and there's, for years and decades, we in America, I can speak to, have seceded, outsourced our judgment to credentialed authorities. And we've gone further away from our nature and what our, what we knew to be right, what seemed like what our sensory perceptions were telling us. And we outsourced it to the diet and food industry, to these credentials. But they were the industry. We didn't know it. We just saw that these people had credentials. Uh, wow. Um, you know, Dr. Fauci has been the leading doctor in America for 20 years. Why would he lie? And the real battle moving forward, I think, is it, 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 you mentioned bro science earlier. And I, I kind of don't like that term. I know, I know you use it. I, I think it's almost diminishing. I look at it as science. It is science. It is, right? Because these are people who are testing a hypothesis and then they're showing us the results. But we're supposed to look away from that. We're supposed to say that's an anomaly. It's and an N equals one. No matter how many of them you show them, they're all N equals to one. You can't add them together. But I think what COVID did for a lot of people was it, it jumped the shark. It, it broke them down. I, For instance, I used to never doubt that we landed on the moon. I thought that would... Now I'm not sure. And I think we did, but I don't know. And it's because I have so, I, I've dug so far down into what these institutions of credentialed people who came out of university, who we were told to trust our whole lives. And one by one, anytime I peel back the layer, even a little bit, it's completely revealed that we've been psyoped. And it's not out of some, I don't think there's this grand conspiracy where people meet in a room. They all benefit. And with the fiat money printer, that's the wheel that can, because there's no opportunity cost in fiat. Everything can just, it can, it, it, slant, it pushes a table up and just moves everything in one direction through taking our work and our resources and pushing it to their ends. And I think that there's an opportunity right now and you see it. I can see it in people who have never doubted established thought that it's starting to crack and there's fissures. And I think you're on the front lines of that and, and the Dr. Sean Baker and there's countless, countless others who are Nina Teichels, who are Kelly Means, are pushing through the matrix. And one by one, you're starting to look around because guess what? Results matter. And that's why bro science, as you refer to it, I love it because it's people showing results. And if we evaluate these experts by results, over the past 50 years, they have failed us to an unbelievable extent. Yet there's no opportunity to cost to failure because of fiat, which is why Bitcoin or really any hard currency, but Bitcoin seems like the best one. It isn't Bitcoin to me that 
makes everything better is that Bitcoin kills the fiat monetary system. More importantly, Bitcoin is the antidote to fiat. And that is what, it, it doesn't give me the ability to see better or to be smarter, but what it does do is it ends the PSYOP because suddenly that becomes cost prohibitive because now the three to $10 billion in corn subsidies, you have to look at the taxpayer and say, I can't just print this. So here's what we're going to use the money for. And you're going to get a lot more resistance. You're going to have a lot less war, a lot less of everything. But once people can think more clearly, then they'll be able to see it all. But it's a loop. And Tucker Carlson was kind enough to give me a blurb for this book. And he had a, he had a great blurb. And it, it was about how you're eating this food that makes you unable to think clearly. And it perpetuates a system of being able to, uh, to to be able to have continue to have food that makes us docile. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a very very astute summation of the book. That um, um, the reason people continue to eat garbage is because they are unfortunately cognitively compromised by all the garbage that they're eating that they can't figure out that they're eating garbage. It's it's the malnutrition that's making you think this garbage is food, and uh, snapping out of that malnutrition and eating proper food, you'll immediately realize, oh, wow, it becomes easier to realize things because your brain starts working rather than uh, living in a fog, basically. Um, <laughs> but I think it, it, it's good to tie things together. We started off with the kind of um, individual stories. And I think uh, we should be, we, we should uh, clarify that there is a an overarching theme and an overarching thesis, both to my chapter in the fiat standard and to your uh, work in the fiat food book, which is that it's it's not just that a coincidence happened where this strange, small little sect of Christians managed to hijack it with a bunch of Harvard scientists and a bunch of food uh, companies. They had serious wind in their sails. They had serious um, institutional uh, reasons for why these ideas succeeded over such a long period of time. And, and that is inflation. And that is inflation. And, and it's, it, it's, it's a twofold, um, it's a twofold boost. It's like, uh, on the one hand, you're devaluing people's money. And this is, I think, the, the, the crux of my thesis in the fiat standard. And I believe you carried it forward and illustrated more in, in your book, which is on the one hand, Inflation has taken away your purchasing power. So your paycheck is going uh, uh, to be able to buy you fewer things or lower quality things. And so that necessitates that you need to start looking for cheaper alternatives to the food. On the other hand, where's that purchasing power going? It's not just getting burned. Somebody's getting it. That inflation of the creation of the new money is redistributing the wealth back to people who are essentially connected to government. So on the one hand, you're losing the ability to buy the things that you want to buy. On the other hand, the government is gaining the ability to shape your reality in all kinds of ways, which it could not do before the fiat money printer. When you kept your purchasing power, they could not have criminals like Ansel Keys and the Harvard Nutrition Department have their criminal ideas in every living room on TV on every newspaper, in every medical journal, in every medical association. You could not do that without having the financial means of inflation. It's a little bit like war. And in a sense, it is war. It is a war on your mind that there are no bullets being fired, but you are getting killed. <laughs> Slow. It's, just, it, it, it's, it's shocking for me to be laughing at this, but it is, it is a war on your mind. And, you know, these universities, mainstream media and the agribusiness, they are very adamant on continuing to press uh, this viewpoint on everybody. And the reason they can do it is because of its uh, inflation. And this is why I think the term fiat food is extremely astute and extremely uh, applicable. And I think I should, I should remember. We should have probably done this in the book. I just remembered it recently, but I sh we should have thanked uh, Michael Goldstein, Bidstein, my very good friend who came up with the term fiat food on Twitter um, many years ago. I think it's a very astute term because it's not a coincidence that uh, people on fiat monetary systems end up eating garbage. 
they are being impoverished. They can no longer afford, afford the food that they and their ancestors have always sought and desired. And their government is becoming richer. And the government is being able to use that money to influence them, to tell them that you shouldn't be eating this food. You should be eating that food. You should be eating the cheap stuff. So uh, my contention in the fiat standard, and I would welcome anybody to challenge me on this. I've published the fiat standard almost two years ago. I've not had a single person write a uh, rebuttal of this thesis, which is I argue modern nutrition science and modern climate science are garbage pseudosciences whose only rationale, well, maybe not only, but whose main rationale is to justify you cutting down on things that are becoming expensive because of inflation. You have to eat every day and you have to consume energy every day. That's where inflation is felt. You buy a shoes, you buy your shoes, you know, once every few months or once a year or once every couple of years. You buy a couch once every five years. You buy a house once every 20 years or so. But the real pain of inflation is felt on a daily basis if you're uh, with the food and with the fuel, because every day you need to, well, almost every day you need to put gas in your car. Every month you have to pay a um, utility bill for your electricity and for the gas and for all of these other essential sources of energy that we have that without which we wouldn't have our amazing uh, lives that we have today. And we'd go back to living precariously in the jungle, struggling to survive every winter. So it's no coincidence that nutrition science wants you to stop eating the meat that is becoming really expensive and to substitute it with garbage that is cheap. And it's also no coincidence that climate science somehow realizes that the way that we can fix the weather, not that there's anything wrong with the weather, the weather has always been like this. There's nothing new on the sun at all, but somehow we can fix it if you just stop consuming these forms of energy that require constant consumption and just went back to the lifestyle of a sixth century peasant relying on a windmill. So when you know you get to grind your grains when uh, the mill, when the windmill, when the wind blows and then it turns your windmill and then you can process your food. Th this is, this is, this is the way in which you can hide inflation. And this was laughable when I was first writing about it and 2019, 2020, when I would talk about this, when I'd give talks about it, I'd get a lot of skepticism. But after 2020, after 2021 in particular, it's becoming very difficult for people to deny this. The way that all establishment, fiat establishment people, basically all of the people that benefit from inflation continue to very, very, very persistently, annoyingly, invasively insist that you must reduce your consumption of meat and you must consume your you reduce your consumption of um, fossil fuels is just way too fishy to be coincidental that, that that's not scientific there's nothing scientific behind it and every time somebody tries to just cut down and eating their garbage and start eating actual human food they feel so much better it becomes very very difficult to um, deny it and so, you know, if anybody's listening here thinks that um, nutrition science or climate science are anything more respectable than utterly idiotic and corrupt pseudosciences, I would welcome you to come and join me on a debate uh, in this uh, podcast to discuss this. Well, obviously, I shouldn't make it an open invitation. I reserve the right to say no if I think you're a complete idiot who's wasting my time. Uh, but... <laughs> I won't say no if you have credentials, um, because then no matter how much of an idiot you are, it's going to be fun. But if you don't have credentials and you're an idiot, it <laughs> might make for a waste of my time. So it's not an open invitation, but still, you know, preferably if you're credentialed and you want to argue that nutritional science is not a criminal, idiotic pseudoscience, please uh, be my guest. <laughs> 1970. Ansel Keys was in his prime, and Seventh Avenue State Church was very big. But 1970, these ideas were still niche. So they were very popular in the religious community that meat was going to lead to everybody dying. And they were, and as the nutrition science was popular in the academic community. However, Americans were still eating plenty of red meat. They were still eating eggs and bacon and saturated fat. When Nixon decoupled completely at that point because because you're right. I mean, it wasn't we weren't in a true gold standard, obviously, but there was still a restraint on the amount of spending because of the Bretton Woods Agreement. 
So when Nixon ended that, and then the money printer just became suddenly it it could pick and choose who it empowered and it could elevate certain people like Ansel Keys in 1970 was in a debate with John Yudkin, who was a a British scientist. But John Yudkin wasn't very, um, very charismatic. John Yudkin was a scientist. And if you know a lot of scientists, they stick to data and they're not on TV a lot. They're generally. He, he, he was a great man. He was, uh, I, I read some of his writing. He's an absolutely astonishing hero. It's, 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 it's such a shame that somebody like him died um, almost in obscurity. Whereas yeah. criminals like the people we study you know, Harvard, like the like Gansel Keys or Frederick Stair, they got all the fame and all the money. It's, it's absolute travesty. Well, it was PR. I mean, they were, it was, it's marketing and Yudkin wasn't a great marketer, but he was a brilliant scientist. And he, Yudkin said that sugar, well, there was a more of a correlation between sugar than saturated fats, but that argument could not happen. And when the fiat money printer came and it began churning money and taking the productive energy of the American people and channeling it into nutrition science and helping to elevate the church is views through the ADA and these other government policies. That's where you see, and, and the idea that, I mean, I think some people might find it absurd that the government would care so much about food inflation that it would rig the entire system. Well, let me point you to Sri Lanka in 2022. Meat went up a lot and so did milk because of fiat. And they stormed the capital and the leadership had to leave. And there's been since then thousands of food riots around the world, not since 2022, hundreds of food riots across the world of the rising cost of food. So the government has one of two choices, really. It can try to deal with people's dissent and ups anger over traditional eating, the rising price of traditional food, or maybe it could just tell us and alter the entire food supply, which is the route they chose. So instead of saying, um, I know meat's going up in price a lot, and I know eggs are going up in price a lot, what we're going to do is say that these things are bad for you. And I point to um, Ralph Samuels. Paul Samuelson wrote a book on this on LBJ. And there was, uh, you had this in your book as well, the situation where eggs were going up in price. And he had his Surgeon General write a phony press release that eggs were bad for you. And it's stuck. It's been 60 years that people still repeat this idea. They still repeat it. 60 years and eggs went down in demand. So the price helped level it off. But Politicians understand that they can get away with a lot, but the rising price at the supermarket of the foods is something that will cause riots and it will cause them to lose their power. So they've psyoped up us to believe us to believe that Fruit Loops are food. Fruit fr Fruit Loops are not really fit for human consumption. I mean, maybe if you're starving, it could provide some benefit. I think that's questionable. But it's over the past fifty and sixty years, it's slowly just kept pumping money and resources to the point where you'll have you'll have this these con kinds of conversations where suddenly even though we've had the conventional view of food for the past thousands of years the fad that we've been in which is probably about 40 to 50 years is now considered conventional wisdom and we're arguing against conventional wisdom that's brilliant marketing indeed it's truly, it's, it's truly incredible. I mean, on the one hand, it is marketing, um, uh, but y y you're kind of being a little unfair towards Yudkin that, um, he didn't have a gigantic, uh, <laughs> global financial system that wanted to push his ideas. So if, if he was batting for the other team to borrow a baseball, uh, expression, he'd have become a lot more charismatic and convincing and famous, probably. It, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's it's uh, you look you look at some of the um, modern uh, nutrition scientists. I mean, they don't particularly inspire a lot of admiration. Have you heard the woman, uh, the, the, uh, Doctor Fatima Stanford? I believe her name is. I mean, I wouldn't trust her to babysit my child. So this is this doctor who was on sixty Minutes, and she is pushing a narrative that obesity is genetic. 
And this goes back, I, I find, I, I illustrate this point in my book because I find this very important because it goes back to what they're really authorities right now under fiat are trying to do. And their big push is to literally try to remove cause and effect. And once they do that, once we are no longer even able to control our own health safe, if they can convince us that we're, that our own health is out of control, then we're fodder for anything they want to do, whether it's inject us with whatever. I mean, we lose all self-autonomy when we disconnect how we feel, our health, to what we consume. Once they can do that, and that they're starting to try to do that now. And she is, I mean, I don't know if she's a moron or if she, I, I don't understand because she seems, she speaks well, she seems well read. I don't know her personally, but what she says is dumb. And worse than that, I can't imagine anything more damaging than taking the responsibility away from individuals and putting it in the hands of pharmacies. Because the context to her conversation, this was on 60 Minutes in January of 2023, was that there's a new drug coming out that will solve it. And you know, you doesn't matter what you eat, take our drug. And this isn't just a drug, it's a drug you take every month, it's a shot. Ozempec and these other these this is the future. This is where they're trying to steer us. Yeah, I mean we're already beginning to hear the reports about what happens to people that take this uh, evil concoction, and I can only imagine what's going to happen in the long term. I think in a few years it's going to uh, we're going to get an enormous industry of fiat scientists out there uh, making money from discovering that oh well what we thought of as the miracle drug is actually probably not that good for you and maybe you shouldn't be having so much of it it's obviously going to happen the, the thing seems to be massively destructive for uh, muscle mass uh, and it's uh, causing a lot of health problems but yeah it's a, it's what you what you do a very good job of in the book is showing how the psyop is, you know, it's, it's not innocent that all these Muppets get on your TV and start repeating uh, things um, because there's a thing that they're selling. You know, it's, it's no coincidence that you get this push toward, look, stop thinking about obesity. It's too complicated. This is, uh, uh, this is by the way, one of the most common things that uh, nutrition professor idiots say is that you just, don't understand. We don't understand. It's too complex. Nutrition is too complex. Uh, so is is it okay to eat soybeans? Well, it's too complex. There are studies that show all kinds of different things, and you wouldn't understand the studies because obviously you're an ignorant peasant, unlike us uh, professors with PhDs. And so leave the studies to us and just take the important conclusion for you is that you should eat everything in moderation. Everything in moderation, which is one of the dumbest ideas um, that you could ever hear because, you know, everything in moderation, well, what does that everything include and what is moderation? So how much hay should you eat? How much cattle feed? Um, how much dirt? How much cocaine every day? How much alcohol? Uh, what uh, what constitutes moderate consumption of alcohol? Uh, what constitutes moderate consumption of hay? Well, there are endless questions to be asked about those things. And the idea that you should try things in moderation is without doubt some of the dumbest advice you could ever give to anybody, particularly because the morons who give this advice, you know, when they tell you eat everything in moderation, they include things that are highly, highly addictive, that are engineered to get you to become addicted to them. The processed food that comes in uh, shiny plastic packaging in your supermarket that's not just there, uh, you know, it's not some old grandma recipe to make those things happen. These things have been concocted in labs by food scientists who have figured out the exact best combinations of salt, fat, sugar to get you completely hooked. And so if you tell people, yeah, go ahead, you know, try everything in moderation, you know, if you tell told somebody to go and try everything in moderation and that everything included cocaine, they're going to get addicted to cocaine. If you told them to try, you know, have have regular doses of this thing because it is, uh, you know, in moderation. Well, you just need to define moderation as being an enormous number. So in the food pyramid, um, moderate consumption of grains is, as you said, six to 11 ratios of grain a day. And with meat... 
<laughs> it's you know it's a, they don't even ask you to eat meat they tell you should eat um proteins which uh, for me i think that's another psyop i think when people started calling it protein rather than meat that's how you end up eating soy and uh, beans and garbage that is more uh, suitable for cows to eat than for us so you get people to believe in uh, you get people to think that eating meat is just uh, one way of getting your protein rather than the most uh, perfect and ideal food for you as a human being and then they're getting a few dozen grams of uh, meat every day on average and getting a bunch of grains uh, for their protein and then a bunch of grains for their energy well that stuff is highly addictive they're going to get enormously addicted to it and then when they get addicted to it it's going to be pretty nasty because they're not going to get addicted to the healthy stuff meat isn't addictive but processed grains and processed food and sugary stuff is very addictive and people are going to fall for that and they're going to eat enormous quantities of it and it's going to be extremely 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 difficult for people to moderate some people have you know they have they're born with good metabolism and they can get away with eating garbage for a very long time um you know think of people like supermodels and professional athletes um they're like the worst role models you could have these people were born having won the genetic lottery and they could eat garbage all the for decades and not suffer many problems from it because their metabolism is perfectly healthy and they can uh, handle it but eventually it catches up with them and eventually, and, and this is the really dark side of it, which we discuss in, uh, in, in the podcast I had with Dr. Kate Shanahan, who wrote a great book called uh, Deep Nutrition. It's intergenerational. So you may be healthy, you may be a supermodel uh, or uh, an elite athlete, and you can get away with eating anything. But then if you eat garbage, your kids are not going to be like you. And so you see this very commonly. A lot of um, you know great athletes grow up in poverty, grew up in poor countries, in places where they didn't have highly processed food as, as a regular staple in their diet. And so they grew up a lot healthier. And now their kids, you know, their kids are born rich uh, in um, rich places where there's a lot more access to that stuff and their kids end up being uh, nowhere near as um, good as athletes as they are. It's, it's, it's a common thing that you see. And then it catches on, oh, you know, it gets worse and worse with each generation. And the sad, really uh, depressing thing about it is that Kellogg was right. Just because he was uh, deeply criminal in what he did does not mean he was wrong. He was right. Meat does give you lust. Um, but that's what being a healthy, normal person uh, is. You, you have sexual desire because you're healthy, because you're meant to recreate. Um, if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be here. You only have it because every single ancestor of yours had it and they had it as an over you know this was it was an urge that was so strong for them that they managed to act upon it have a child and take care of that child well enough that that child was then able to have a child and on and on and on so for many generations you come from a very long line all of us that are alive today come from a very long line of people who had sexual desires it's just what we as humans have and he's right if you eat processed garbage if you eat cornflakes you will kill that sexual desire you will become infertile and if it, you don't become infertile your kids will and if they don't it'll be their kids you're not going to get away with three four generations of eating highly processed garbage and still end up with healthy um offspring somewhere along the line either the line is going to end or somebody's going to wake up and start eating proper food and then they'll start having children again uh, healthy children and you know life would get back to normal and what interests me in in trying to unravel when i read your book first the first time was that it wasn't that i needed to necessarily learn new things that that wasn't my biggest challenge my biggest challenge was i needed to take away the psyop i needed to learn like i needed to unlearn a lot of the faulty things that I've made uh, assumed to be premises in my mind, axioms that I then built further knowledge off of. And when you really look at nature and you understand that nutrition derives from nature and you see how unnatural all these authorities, like we talked about Dr. Stanford, I, I mean, unbelievable woman. She 
she all in that same month, uh, all in that in, in the same short period of time when she's advising that obesity is a result of genetics, these this entire psyop, you could see it all, and I, I I outline it in Fiat Food in a chapter, how it all at the same time, all the media changes there's talking points about obesity. For so if we thought obesity was one thing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Suddenly we're all wrong. New data. We're not smart enough to understand it. And it begins by us ignoring these people and trusting ourselves and trusting our instincts and thinking about nature and our place in nature. And I think that's the foundation for how we have a healthy life individually and as a society. And that's why, you know, say, I like, I love that you, I mean, Fiat Standard really changed my life. Like that book, I, I didn't just read it and try to understand it. I began eating nothing but meat. So the first six months, I had a break about a few few months ago. The first six months of this year, I had nothing but meat and cheese and eggs and, and, and meat products. This is coffee, if people are wondering. I know I drink it out of a straw. It's weird. But it changed my life and it made me think clearly. And one of the things that I noticed immediately within weeks of, of changing to an all-meat diet was that when – so when I'm writing, I, I'm, I'm a writer. And, and when I'm – moving notes from one part to the other. So like I move and I have notes and I'm, I'm typing them out. I used to be able to remember one to maybe one and a half sentences. Within eating meat in 10 days, I was able to remember three or four sentences. Just like that. Like my cognitive ability, my, my, my perceptions were all enhanced. And I've always been a relatively healthy person with the exception of, of my teenage years when I was, when I was a very sick, sick teenager. But I run every day. I've run every day for almost 10 years. I've never missed a day. And my run times began increasing. Um, My vision, I used to be very sensitive to light. Suddenly eating carnivore, my vision helped. So, you know, I'm going to go to a, I don't, I try to stay the hell away from doctors, but I know what's going to happen when I go to one. They're going to say, oh, well, your, your cholesterol might be a little high or, or uh, it's great that you feel amazing and that you run every day and that you you're very active, but it's not sustainable. I'm, I'm worried about your kidneys. <laughs> yes. The kidneys or the thyroid is another one. Yeah. I've been, I've been concerned trolled about all of those things and I've had all the blood tests done and by all metrics, everything seems to be fine. So it's, it's I've been in uh, next week, I'll be eight years, a carnivore. Nice. And, um, you know, if something was missing, I mean, you would expect something to show up at this point. And I continue to get this, that there are all these people that have these ideas. Oh, well, clearly your kidneys are going to be suffering from a diet like this. And I dug into the kidney thing a while ago, by the way. And the reason that all of these zombies repeat the whole idea that low carb is bad for kidneys is because of a bunch of idiotic, nonsensical studies where, uh, uh, guess what they uh, study is they go and they get people, they feed them essentially protein supplements, gym supplements made out of soy, basically. And so they get people, they feed them this industrial waste soy that is ground into powders that you could drink. And, you know, then they study them and then they realize, oh, <laughs> protein diets are bad for your kidney. Therefore, of course, it follows that meat is bad for your kidneys. And so you should cut down on meat. That's the thing that people take from it. And that low carb is bad for you for meat. And that the way that you should, and, and then of course, when you talk to the dietitian who takes the, you know, takes the science and then wants to give you the actionable uh, recommendation from that, well, what do you substitute for the meat? You eat soy. <laughs> so... It's, it's, it's so ridiculous. The evidence for the idea that low carb is going to ruin your kidneys is, is essentially non-existent. And all these people are just sugar addicts who don't want to think about the fact that uh, their addiction is not actually good for them. And so they just cling to these fantastic stories wherein in their world, you know, they're actually taking care of their health by engaging in a daily sugar addiction where they have eight to 15 hits of sugar a day and have hits of sugar with every meal. And then twice between meals all day long, they're just consuming sugar all the time. And apparently that's how you maintain your kidneys in good shape. It's ridiculous. Do you, you've been doing this eight years. Have you 
found that your cognitive ability has improved and your oh, oh absolutely i i wrote my three books uh, on carnivore and i think um I, I don't think i would have written them before like i never had the kind of time preference and focus to be able to sit down and focus on doing something so long term so i i from from the time when i was in school my school teachers used to tell me that you're a good writer but I was always so jacked up on sugar that uh, I could never sit my sit down and write something uh, worthwhile that was worth reading. And then when I went carnivore, it was incredible. It was like I had a superpower. Now I could just sit down and keep churning out pages. I remember what happened to me was um, it was in February 2017. So I went carnivore in October 2015. Yeah, it was exactly eight years from now. So October 1st, 2015 is when I decided I was going to try it for a month. And then I just never looked back. And then it was uh, February 2017, where I thought I'd, I'd already started writing and thinking about writing. And then I decided, uh, you know what, uh, now I need to just set myself a goal. And, and, and like moving from the mentality of wanting to do things versus planning how to get the process in place so that you get things done was a huge uh, life changer because I was one of those um, low focus people who drifts around from one idea to the other without a very clear actionable plan of how you want to get this done. But then once I start focusing a lot more, you figure out, all right, I don't need to have uh, goals about what I want to achieve. I need to have processes of how I want to achieve things. And then, you know, I start plowing the earth and then crops will come out of it rather than just sit and fantasize about what the crops that I want to, uh, what are the crops that I want to have. So I remember it was in February where I decided I'm going to be writing a thousand words a day. Could be articles, could be blog posts, could be book, whatever it is. I'm just going to be writing a thousand words a day. And uh, that was Bitcoin. At that time, Bitcoin was um, occupying my mind share quite a bit. It, and so I decided I'm going to start writing about Bitcoin and initially started off thinking, well, you know, I'm going to write a brief book that I was going to sell on Amazon. But as soon as I started and um, it, it, it was it was it was something incredible that I'd never felt before. I just had this ability to focus and produce a lot of work every day. I would just sit down and write and write and write. And um, I remember this was February 13 when I started. Um, working on the Bitcoin standard. April 26, I was done with the first draft. And that was basically 80% of the book that became the Bitcoin standard. I wrote the whole thing in two and a half months. Obviously, you know, I'd, I'd had a lot of ideas that I'd had developed over years. I had some parts of it that I had written before uh, as, you know, some of these uh, low focus uh, projects where I want to write something and then I write three pages and then it, uh, it goes nowhere or write five pages. Some of these I imported into the manuscript. Uh, but I wrote the whole thing in about two months and a half. And there is absolutely no way that uh, Sugar Addicted Me could have gotten that book done in uh, not even a year, let alone two months. It's definitely the meat. Well, I, I also, before, you know, before we, and I wanted to let you know, I appreciate you starting your publishing house because this is a book I published with major publishers, Simon and Schuster, Scholastic, Harper and Collins, Harper Collins. But I knew that this topic would not find reception in a mainstream publishing house. So when I reached out to you, I did so not knowing that you thought of even considering your own publishing house. And when I pitched you this idea, I'm just very appreciative that you are starting a publishing house and that I have a venue outside of the mainstream where we can get these ideas out out there and i i guess i was also kind of curious if you don't mind discussing like what your what your purpose was and because you have a lot going on you have your lectures you have your books and now you're working with uh, el salvador giving some guidance there so what was your in terms of your time uh, opportunity cost and time your reasoning for wanting to start your own publishing house and all that involves, which is time consuming. Well, the reasoning, um, it, it just came about because I wanted to self-publish my second and third books, uh, The Fiat Standard and Principles of Economics. And in retrospect, I mean, I think I had a very positive experience with Wiley. I mean, they didn't censor the Bitcoin standard. There was a lot of wild things in the Bitcoin standard. And, you know, the, the, the editor read it. He thought it was a great book. He loved it. He wanted to publish it. And like, he'd leave some comments saying, you know, <laughs> You're gonna get crucified over this. I hope you. Re I hope you have a thick skin. Like, yeah, I know. 
um, you know, when I'm talking about Keynes or I'm talking about uh, modern artists or something like that. Uh, but he, I, I must say, like it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't that they were censoring me or that I thought I couldn't uh, get away with it. But I just thought I'd like to keep the rights for the book uh, my own. I'd like to be able to print it whenever I want, wherever I want. And this is really the best thing about it. With self-publishing, I can just control the, the rights. I can sell rights for translations. And I think in the long run, it's going to work out better uh, to just have this uh, editorial freedom over the books, which, you know, things in my life are uh, a lot more functional than they are sort of premeditated and planned. So I wanted to self-publish. I go with this uh, service called Scribe, which helped me publish the Fiat Standard, and they did a great job. They went bankrupt recently, but now they revived, so they couldn't publish my principles of economics because they were going through uh, bankruptcy. But I ended up doing it on my own. But I still recommend uh, people to work with them, check them out. I don't know how um, they're going to be different now, but it was still a positive experience. They handled the process for you, where you know, just send send them a manuscript, and uh, they handle the publication, the printing, getting it on Amazon, getting it distributed, and so on. So they did a pretty good job with that. But they um, they they recommend that you have an imprint. They need to have an imprint. Uh, it's self published, but you know you should have an imprint. You should be publishing under an imprint. So I just thought I'll make my own imprint, and um, I just thought of the name, the Safe House, because it's funny it's that people will get it it'll stick in people's minds and i just went along with it and then i published the fiat standard and then i published the principles of economics and in the back of my mind i started thinking well you know i'm already publishing these i've already got fulfillment centers in europe and in the u.s that handle fulfillment of those books and i've got relationships with printers i should start considering publishing other people's books and that's around the time when you emailed me out of the blue and i was it was already uh, happening and i think it's a great uh, thing and i'm also uh, publishing um, now, I'm publishing a copy of um, Lynn Alden's book, uh, Broken Money. So she's publishing it with Amazon, but uh, Amazon, they only have the glossy uh, hardcover, and she liked the uh, cloth hardcover, which is how I make uh, made the fiat standard and principles of economics. So I'm going to make, uh, a as with you, like you, you'll publish on Amazon where people can get the paperback and the hardback from them, but then if they want the you know, the, the low time preference built to last uh, cloth cover that looks really nice on the bookshelf, uh, then now uh, you can come and get it from the safe house directly. Fantastic. And pre-orders are available today, I believe, correct? Yes, they're going to be available today as this is published. And the book should be delivering in mid to late October. Great. Yeah. I've been looking at the comments as they've been coming through. It's, it's distracting how, because uh, some of them are great. Yeah. And a lot of them are, are mentioning the, uh, the, I, w I would term the, it's interesting because the environmental, the, the seventh, Ave seventh Avenue State Church, I always have issues saying that, has really been co opted and, and combined largely with the growing environmental movement. They all have, and it's by mutual cause. And it's, I mean, look, I don't want to, well, I don't, global warming is obvious, it's, it's very much a religion. I mean, it's, it's a faith based in the same way that the church's philosophies were. And it's pseudoscience made to justify their preconceived notions. I remember being around in the early 2000s when the models came out and I was kind of worried. I thought, wow, this is terrifying. But like everything else, when 2007 arrives and I'm not underwater, nobody apologizes or explains why the model was wrong. We just have a new model. That's even better. I, I just will give credit. To, I give more credit to these uh, end of world people who always schedule the apocalypse after their death. I mean, if you're a smart con, that's what you do. These people like Al Gore and Greta, it's just, it's not smart. Like, that's not what you do. Yeah, recently Greta had to delete a tweet where she tweeted <laughs> something in, I think it was in 2016, she said in the next six years or uh, 2018, she said in the next five years. And then uh, like a week before that tweet hit five years, people were starting to retweet it and then she just deleted it. Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 um, they're religious, but this is the problem with new religions. Like if, if it's not an established religion and you don't have thousands of years or hundreds of years of a track record and a good story that has survived for hundreds of years, it's really hard for all these new upstarts 
to come up with a coherent story. You know, it's like you're, uh, it's like you're having to come up with an alibi and a story for, uh, to try and prove your innocence right on the spot being interrogated. It's difficult. Like you need hundreds of years of, of, of <laughs> apocalyptic doom mongering in order to know how to do it right. Um, I mean, it's worked out for, um, Al Gore, obviously, he's become a billionaire by scaring people from this uh, uh, insane hysteria. But yeah, we are not underwater. The polar ice caps have not melted. The sea levels have not risen. The weather continues to weather. Uh, that's just what the weather does. It's sometimes it rains a lot. Sometimes it rains a little. Sometimes it's too cold. Sometimes it's too hot. It's Perfectly, everything is perfectly within a normal distribution, pretty much. Um, very few outliers. And, and the notion that anything catastrophic is happening is becoming more and more ridiculous to more people. I think um, it's now been about a year, actually. To, actually, I think it's this week. It might be a year exactly since I asked on my Twitter somebody to come on this podcast to debate me on the contention that we are in a climate crisis because of carbon dioxide emissions. And nobody will stand up to that. And it's amazing. I mean, the, these people will ask you to give up the fuels you need to survive for the winter in favor of some obscure woo energy source that they think maybe might sometime maybe happen. Uh, they're comfortable enough asking you to sacrifice the things that you need for survival. They're not comfortable enough wasting one hour, spending one hour trying to defend the fact that we are in a crisis. It's deeply despicable behavior, but you know you wouldn't expect anything better from people who did this. Well, I'm going to I'm going to give you a spoiler spoiler alert on this. Nobody will come debate you because the, the credentialed advocates of this uh, global warming religion. Their argument depends on your submission to their credentials as evidence. Once critical analysis begins, their argument falls apart. So they will not subject themselves to this. And you saw this with um, Joe Rogan guy trying to get the debate between Kennedy and one of the very overweight COVID doctors. And it's like, of course, they're not going to come on. They have nothing to gain by coming on because they get exposed you're supposed to bow to the credentials and the increasing amount of people who are no longer bowing to the credentials is the biggest threat they face. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the kind of bright side here is that at this point, you have to be extremely, extremely dull to not have seen a bunch of red flags that have made you sit back and reconsider are we really in a climate crisis that requires me to eat garbage and freeze in the winter? Or is it, is there some other nefarious agenda here? And I think, you know, if you made it to 2023 and you haven't started uh, questioning, <laughs> you're going to have a very, very, very bad time in all kinds of avenues of life because clearly thinking is not your strong suit. And, 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 and a tying weather to human behavior is not new. That's not new with the global warming thing. We've been doing this since, since I believe, since the advent of man. And you go back to the Middle Ages where crops would not come in as expected. So we're going to burn some women. And that's what they would do. They would, they would murder women who must have been doing something eccentrically bizarre. And as a result, the crops weren't coming in. So uh, we're going to appease the gods. And we do the same, we like to think we're so much more sophisticated, but the truth is we're doing the same thing on a much wider, more heinous scale under the guise of credentialism. Absolutely. I had a, uh, a long uh, tweet thread about this once. Um, you know, the 97% of scientists agree. I don't know if you ever saw that one. I'm digging it up one sec. So the text of the tweet goes, 97% of priests agree that child sacrifice is necessary for a good harvest. What makes you think you know better what we should do with your child? You're not even a priest. Stop being selfish and hand over your kid. And there's a picture of old Mayan uh, sacrifice, child sacrifice. And then it's uh, the whole thread is just pictures of mine, child sacrifice, and then quotations from me, basically <laughs> replacing scientists with priests. And just, it's the same exact thing. It's the same exact thing. 
Quote, nobody enjoys child sacrifice, but it's important to be pragmatic. Until we can transition to fully renewable child technology, we have to sacrifice your child. Stop being an extremist and hand over your child. I roll. So you're saying all the priests are wrong? Or they are all part of some evil grand conspiracy? Smirk. And you, just another peasant, are the only one who knows what should be done with your child? (laughs) This is exactly it. Like this is how they treat us. It's it's your life. You know, we want to take away the fuels that you need to survive. And who the hell are you to tell us that we don't know what's best for you? It's your show. My favorite is that I, I in World War II, um, the America was told not to eat meat because meat makes you strong. We needed to conserve it for our soldiers abroad because they need the meat to fight war. And now it's changed where we need America to stop eating meat because meat is a temperature dial and eating meat is going to destroy the world. And, you know, it's the threat of guilt of trying to, and I kind of dive into this. I wish I could dive into it more in the book. And I, it, it's this thread where the government makes you feel guilt. And if they can make us feel guilt over our nature, then we're tools for whatever cause they want to they, they, they is on cue for them I mean, generally the attainment of power and more, but it starts with guilt and it can make us feel guilt. Look, my mask helps you. Your mask helps me. Do you want to be the reason that grandma dies? <laughs> right. I mean, we laugh, but it's true. Like, well, it's true. I mean, this is, it's, we just came out of this, pandemic where, um, I mean, I, I got COVID and I still ran every day. I felt it. It wasn't fun. I didn't like it. But when you separate yourself from the news cycle and as somebody who spent my decades in the news cycle, creating news, uh, reporting on news, being in that, you see that narrative runs everything. And that's part of the reason I removed myself from the conventional news. I was a reporter at the New York Daily News for 10 years. And that was an experience that was very eye-opening in terms of how editorial control focuses on narrative. And then that narrative, once it's in, it's very hard to, to, to push back on it. And that's the beauty of the internet. It's the decentralization of information in the same way that Bitcoin is the decentralization of money. Like we get to control our money again. We are in control of our own money. And there's freedom to that, and it, I think harmony in nature. Indeed, absolutely. And I think I agree entirely. Anybody have any more questions? Well, Harry's asking, could I ask what is behind the campaign against health and reproduction? Is it simply about money? If I were to answer, I don't think it's simply about making money. I think it's about, uh, it's just the lie that is the cover up for the money printing. There's just, This technology called the printing press that uh, Bernanke has uh, mentioned, uh, as Bernanke called it, it's just a very highly lucrative thing. And once you get that thing going, you're going to keep digging in and trying to find more and more excuses and justifications for it. That's how I see it. Um, What do you think, Matthew? I think it goes beyond. I think it goes beyond that. I'll take it a step further. I think that it's, it's about control and we're at a place where our authorities, there's a very strong anti-life movement is, is for lack of better words, where anything good, fiat creates a bizarre world. Like to use a, Se- a Seinfeld reference, there's an episode where there was characters that were exactly like them, but the opposite. And there's, fiat creates an upside down world where life, where good up is uh, good is bad, bad is good, everything's sort of goofy. And I look at this all as this movement by a segment of our authorities to, through our own guilt as a tool, have us just relinquish more and more control. Because that's the only direction this has gone. So when they're saying, don't have more children, um, I have four daughters and I can tell you, having a family makes you look at government different and people trying to control you differently. It's, I can't explain it. It's just something that happened when I had kids, but suddenly you become very protective. And I think again, it's in line with nature and they're trying to, um, 
not to sound like a cliche, but the amount of the extent they'll go to maintain their power has no limits. Yeah. Well, I think with Bitcoin, they may have met their match. I think it's just if Bitcoin continues to do what it does, it's going to make things trickier for people who want to continue to profit from money printing. So, you know, we'll be here eating steak and stacking sats and (laughs) seeing how this works out. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for writing the book. And I wish you all the best of luck on uh, the sales. And uh, yeah, we'll stay in touch and see how it goes. And we'll have you over here again to discuss more and more uh, fiat-related ideas. Most interesting interview I've ever had. Thank you, Safe. I appreciate it. (laughs) Thanks a lot. Cheers.